Cool. Excellent. So following directly on from that, I want to take a deep dive into the murky, dangerous and potentially risky area of putting proxy financial values onto cultural heritage assets, because that, of course, is exactly what DCMS are currently promoting and up to and leading on, the new Culture and Capital Portal, which, to quote from their website, the Culture and um, Historic Capital approach to, will be to policy and decision making. It will consider the value of heritage as a society. It will be a transformational and cultural change to assessing value for money through robust, robust appraisal and evaluation, quote, dollar values. It will produce research data, guidance and tools to help organisations make a stronger case for investment in heritage. And it is consistent with the Treasury Green Book principles. And what I want to talk about, uh, and, to, and this is the kind of approach that we're doing, that they're doing. There was a useful seminar a few weeks ago led by Historic England with, um, I'm sorry to Adala for this screenshot, it's a pretty horrible one, um, but with some really useful presentations from Historic England on what it's about and how it will work. And what I really want to talk to you about today is that, as with Sarah, I mean, I think this is an important initiative. We cannot ignore it. Whatever we think about the philosophical challenges of putting um, proxy financial values onto heritage assets, there are good reasons for doing it, it if, if nothing else, because it gets us around the top table in terms of financial allocation and decision making at the highest level in government. And what I want to say to you today is, funnily enough, I've actually been working in this field. For the last year, I've been revising the Welsh guidance on transport appraisal, which uses benefit-cost um, ratios applied to transport projects to think about value. And, and as a result of that, I've learned some useful lessons, which I think we can take back into the heritage space and use to think about how we might respond critically, as Sarah said so beautifully, to this initiative and engage with it by making sure that it's a positive agenda for what we want to achieve and not something that is potentially quite um, negative. And that means we need to, um, as Sarah says, be critical, look under the bonnet and think about what we're achieving. So I spoke yesterday, and we've heard Sarah actually sort of summarise very well indeed, that the history of talking about the values of, of heritage is a long one. It goes back many years. And in parallel with this history, we've had a long history of working with economists on valuing cultural heritage assets, certainly as, as far back as the 1990s. I remember various exercises um, happening in and around that space. So, and look, here's one. <laughs> I've even put caring for the earth up there. Um, and all of that was very much, as Sarah says so beautifully, shaped by that discourse around sustainable development and engaging with those wider economic and social agendas. So to jump quickly onto the application of this sort of model and how it can potentially work. Um, the Treasury Green Book is essentially the guidance on spending public money in government. It is, if you like, the kind of uber underpinning philosophical document that shapes so much of what happens in government. And it's about how we define value for money. Um, but also, the whole is, this whole is issue of public interest is also there in things like the land use planning system, in charity um, commissions, and of course we've heard about public value most recently. So this issue about how we create value for the public, and particularly how we create value for money, is a really central and important underlying question. And what happens in transport appraisal is transport appraisal actually operationalises the Green Book in terms of making decisions about new road schemes. So it turns those high-level philosophical ideas about value for money into a, an appraisal methodology based on the Green Book. It's relevant to road schemes. It's all about how you make a good business case. There's lots of technical guidance in there about how you can model 
monetized values and you can use those in decision making. Uh, it makes extensive use of benefit cost ratios where you take the costs of the scheme and you take the monetized benefits and you subtract one from the other and you get the answer of whether or not it's a good idea to build a new road scheme. There are a lot of issues that have got monetized values, so things like the health costs of air quality are monetized, travel time savings are monetized. As Sarah said, over the last few years, the biodiversity world has been going down the road of creating monetized values for natural assets, but other areas, such as heritage, don't have monetized values. And this is the gap that DCMS is seeking to address through the whole capital accounting approach. Now, what I'm doing with the transport appraisal guidance um, has been looking at how we apply it in Wales. And the things that, that has become really clear to me about the Green Book is that the Green Book is an approach, but it doesn't stop you from applying your own values to it. And in Wales, We've got the Future Generations Act, which puts sustainability at the core of government. And we've got devolved issues such as planning policy and devolved issues such as transport policy. And I've just drafted Hwebenoeth, which is the new Welsh transport policy guidance. So when we interpret the Green Book, we've got to interpret it in terms of our own values. So there's no point in using cost-benefit ratios that actually give you the wrong answer by putting a huge emphasis on travel time savings and not on, for example, the cost of carbon emissions. So what I'm doing is reviewing the Wales Transport Appraisal Guidance to make sure that it reflects our own values, that it reflects the things that we want to achieve in Wales, and that it doesn't accidentally set policy by the back door, which is the kind of sneaky thing that you can do with some of this accounting. Um, I've also got to make sure that it's proportional to the kind of projects that we have in Wales, that it reflects our seven wellbeing goals, um, and it helps us make better decisions. So, and that's the important lesson for heritage. If in thinking about how we apply the Green Book to transport policy in Wales, we need to reflect the circumstances of Welsh transport policy, if we're going to do the same thing by applying monetized values to heritage, we also need to make sure that we're not setting heritage policy accidentally by the back door, that we are reflecting our own heritage policies, that we are reflecting some of the things that Sarah was talking about in her early. We don't just deal uncritically with this sort of thing. And this is why it's so terribly important that everybody, all of the organisations in this room, really engage with this initiative that's coming from DSMS, that we don't just leave it to the economists, that we look under the bonnet and make sure that we understand whose values and which values are being taken into account. Um, one of the things that I'm doing in Wales is I'm working with this rather nice man called Phil Goodwin, who is a transport appraisal expert who's been doing it for many years. And he said, oh, Kate, I've just been looking at this for the A303. So here is a couple of slides taken directly from Phil Goodwin's work. So he's a transport appraisal. And what he's done is looked at how those kind of transport appraisal numbers were applied to the A303 um, issue and to actually make a case for the road. So you can see. Um, from his induction, induction, introduction here. Well, his argument is that the appraisal is based on a deeply flawed transport infrastructure strategy and is not suitable. Um, but even if we accept all the assumptions and forecasts, he did a little numerical exercise. And he said, this is how the transport appraisal works for the A303. So you look at the benefits in terms of travel time savings, you look at the indirect tax revenue you might get, you might look at the value, monetary value of the reduction in accidents, journey time reliability, wider economic benefits. Now, there's a few losses from extra pollution, but there's lots of transport benefits, um, and those are the total costs of the scheme and the net, net loss. But then um, he looks at the heritage benefits of the value of removing the road
from the World Heritage Site. And that creates this whole new additional benefit that suddenly means that we've got a net surplus. Absolutely great scheme, job done. And that benefit is calculated by asking people what they'd be willing to pay in order to remove the road from Stonehenge and generate, you know, and look, you know, and dividing it up and doing the maths. Job done, fantastic. It's obviously a great new scheme. Except that it's also potentially a very damaging scheme. And the value that people attribute to something like that essentially depends on the question that you ask them. And as he says, if you ask people um, what people would be willing to pay to remove, to protect Stonehenge, you might get one answer. If you ask a different question, you might get a very different economic valuation. So the key question here is that those economic valuations, they are not fixed values, they are not immutable, they are not objective. So if we're going to make sure that this kind of approach to evaluation works for heritage, for heaven's sake, we can't just rely on these kind of contingent valuation studies. More importantly, we need to develop an underpinning heritage services model because this is what's happened with the natural world that looks at what services cultural heritage provides and how it adds value. We need to be really clear about what studies where we're using um, and we mustn't let modeling and benefit cost ratios deliver heritage policy by the back door. And as part of that, we need to develop a cultural services model for heritage. We need to start by understanding what cultural assets are, and I think this is one of the challenges the group's having at the moment, even thinking about what we mean by archaeology. It is not just ruins, thank you very much. It's much wider than that. The approach also needs to understand the value created by doing archaeology, not just archaeological assets. We need to think about whether we're just going to take that ecosystem services model that's used to the natural capital or whether we're actually going to develop our own robust and resilient one. Historically, England have started to do some work on that, but are we content with it? Do we agree with it? Does it do everything that we need to do it? Are we engaging with it? And I think we need to think very carefully about what services cultural assets actually provide before we can even thinking think about putting effectively dollar values on them. And we need to remember that monetized values for heritage assets, as I've said over and over again, are not a substitute for good policy. We mustn't let them make... Some of, sometimes there is an assumption when you read the DCMS website that if we've got dollar, in, number values for cultural heritage assets, we don't have to worry about all this complicated policy issue because we know exactly how much a heritage asset is worth and we can do the numbers and decide what to do. Policy is much more complicated than that. Um, and as Sadie said in her presentation, we cannot ever walk away to, from those, and I use apologise for using this twice, from those qualitative understandings of what value is and the qualitative toolkit for understanding the different ways in which people value places. You will never replace those with monetised values. But it is an important agenda, and DCMS is absolutely right. Having Engaging with those economic things does get heritage around the top table. It does get us into those decision-making spaces, but we need to use it critically and carefully. So there you are. And there's a couple, I wrote a little article about it um, in, in Historic Environment, and there's a few other references just there from where I got those. And for those of you who heard me speak yesterday, just for the record, I've also whacked up some of the sources from the work that I spoke about yesterday. Um, which will be on the recorded thing if anybody wants any of those. So thank you very much indeed.